nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So as we finished with our lecture last time, we discussed how we were going to use uh, or outline uh, the lectures from here. And we talked about basically the first section of this class, the MSC 582 portion of this class, um, going through and learning how to use the microscope. We're, we talked about how we would first try to understand how the electron source works and optimizing the amount of electrons out of the source. And then we talked about how we would go through and learn how lenses work, the aberrations in lenses, how to put the uh, instrument together completely, align it, and, and take some pictures out of it. Um, the first thing I want to do before we do any of that is to kind of remind everyone uh, about an electron. Needless to say, because it's the primary uh, thing being used to interrogate our sample, it's worth remembering what electrons are and how they work. And so what I'm presenting here is a, a, a real short reminder of electron properties and in particular wave particle duality, um, which is of course a strange concept for anyone. Um, no matter how many times you think about it, uh, it still is, uh, there's a bit of, of mystery and magic in this um, because it's, it's, it's just a strange concept. So what I'm going to do is try to present to you a way that I think about it um, and, and maybe it'll help you as we go further in the class. Uh, additionally, what's interesting about uh, electrons, right, they do exhibit both particle and wave-like behavior um, depending on the experiment you are using uh, to test that. And uh, the electron microscope is a fundamental proof of the wave-particle duality nature of the electrons. If they were not particles, we would not be able to focus them with a lens. If they did not behave like waves, they would not diffract. Okay? So the aspects of wave-particle duality are perfectly evident every single time we use the microscope. And that is a, a, an interesting thing, I think. You know? uh, and really, there's no way we could do any of the things with this microscope that we are going to do unless it held both particle and wave properties. And so it's worth thinking about that. And I know that uh, you know, despite having thought about this for many years, I'm still uh, searching for ways in my head to reconcile uh, my understanding of this. So I'll present a way that I think about it, OK? Um, Wave-particle duality is routinely manifested in the electron microscope. Um, the, the thing to, to, to think about here is that we, we want to think about an electron coming off of the source and, and coming down through the column of the microscope and ask ourselves a, quest, a couple questions to, to really prove that this is truly manifested all the times. Um, let's take an electron that comes out of our source. We'll learn how sources work later um, and comes out at 100 kilovolts. That's a fairly standard operating voltage, uh, low end operating voltage for an electron microscope. At this point, uh, the velocity of this, the relativistic uh, velocity, is half or so the speed of light. So it's moving quite quickly, uh, 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. If we measure the current of the electrons coming off of a source, if we just put a little detector down here to measure the current of electrons coming off of a source, we find out that there's something like 10 to the 12 electrons per second being collected at that detector point. If you go through and think about the microscope, it's a couple meters long, right? And look at this number and that number. What it tells you is that within the microscope, there is a single electron that's being emitted and travels down through the column and interacts with your sample at a given point in time, right? And then travels through the rest of the column and hits the detector. So at any point in time, we are only looking at the interaction between a single electron and our sample. And then as we average over the collection time for an image, right, we're averaging over multiple interactions between the sample and different large numbers of electrons. Okay? So that's just a simple fact by the speed with which they move, how big the electron column is, and the number of electrons that come off of our source. So everything that we see in the electron microscope is a result of the interaction of a single electron with the source. As an aside, 
Um, there are developments happening in the field of electron microscopy where people are building pulsed source electron guns for doing high frame rate imaging. And that assumption is much different. Um, uh, but for the microscopes that we're going to use, um, it's really true that there's only one electron at the time. Okay? And so despite the fact that we have only one electron in the microscope at a given time, we see clear evidence of both particle and wave phenomena. Um, we see electron diffraction occurring. Diffraction can only occur if the electron exhibits wave-like behavior. Um, we see electron interference show up um, in the form of high resolution images. If we take the direct beam and superimpose it with some diffracted beams or scattered beams that are coherently scattered, we will find that we get an interference pattern. Again, that can only happen if we have um, a, a, a wave-like nature to it. Um, electrons have been proven to also have particle type behavior through the photoelectric effect. And again, that's an external to the microscope uh, fact. But inside the microscope, the fact that electrons are able to be focused with magnetic lenses is indicative of the fact that they are particles. And so we do have to always throughout this class remember that we can talk about the electron as we need to for a given experimental moment. We can talk about it as a particle. We can talk about it as a wave. There's no problems there. Um, thanks to quantum mechanics, it's just one of these sorts of things. Okay, What you're going to find is as the class proceeds, um, someone like myself who's been doing this a while will just naturally switch back and forth between particle descriptions and wave descriptions, kind of willy-nilly, um, without any lack of comfort. All right? um, so it's just something you end up doing. You end up saying, OK, here it is, and, and talking about it as a particle, and then in another moment talking about it as a wave. And that glosses over some things, but just get comfortable with it. And that's essentially how most of quantum mechanics um, an understanding of quantum mechanical phenomena work. You just hear people talk about it often enough until at some point you go, okay, yeah, makes sense, or I accept it, or, or whatever. That's, that's my experience, all right? Um, so this is a key point. In the microscope, we're going to talk about electrons both as particles and waves. Um, whenever we talk about, for example, diffraction, you'll be thinking about the electron as a wave. Whenever we talk about scattering, um, scattering for things like uh, the creation of... Uh, of, of x-rays for, for inelastic scattering, um, or just simple scattering of the electron for the, the, the interaction of the electron with any atom, we'll be thinking more in terms of it as a particle. And again, we'll flip back and forth between these two different descriptions. OK, so <coughs> pardon me. Again, this is just a way that, in, in my mind, I, I have some thoughts on how I think about wave-particle duality and, and gain some comfort with this. And it comes out of the mathematics of these things. Um, whenever you talk about a wave, what you're talking about is a periodic disturbance in both space and time. right? So a wave is something that has a spatial component, a temporal component. And you can write the equation for a wave like this. There's many ways you can write a wave equation. This is just one of them. Um, the, and one that you're going to see uh, very, very frequently in this class. All right. Um, so here we're looking at sinusoidal um, with a one-dimensional spatial variation just in x and a temporal variation here. Right. And you can also rewrite this using something called, instead of using uh, 2 pi over the wavelength, that's lambda, you can write it in terms of a wave vector, which takes this 2 pi over lambda and incorporates it in. So whenever we have a wave, we have a uh, periodic disturbance in space and time. Now, just follow along with this, and, and, and you'll see where I'm going at the end. Um, if you have one wave, you have another wave. It's possible to think about their overlap. right? So let's call this one wave number one. Let's give it an equation that has this sinusoidal variation, a temporal and, uh, and uh, spatial, and a second wave that has a very small difference in the wave vector and in the, uh, the uh, uh, frequency of that wave. All right? So if we go through and superimpose these waves together, and we use a little bit of trigonometry, right? Um, don't, don't worry, this derivation is not very important. The result's more interesting. You find out that if we take wave one plus wave two, right? consider their overlap, we can describe two parts to this. One's a cosine variation, and another is just simply a sinusoidal variation that looks much like the original wave. If we look at this graphically, what we're finding is that this wave here is essentially a sinusoidal wave like the one we started off with, with a slightly different uh, wave vector, a slightly uh, different frequency. 
and there's a modulation imposed by this term here. And so whenever you have two waves together, you're going to see something that looks like this. Here we're showing that same wave as a function of spatial uh, character only, and you can think about this as a temporal variation as well. Um, I'll show it to you in a moment also uh, off of the web here. But really what you're getting is an analogy equivalent to the sound of beats you hear when you take two notes that are close to each other and listen, you hear them beat against each other. So again, if you have electron one, electron two with slightly different frequencies, you would see them uh, forming a beat like pattern uh, such as this. Um, I like this little uh, link here. So let me see if I can make it work. And this is just to show the temporal variation of this. And you can see that if you have differences in frequency, and, and you know, for those of you all listening on the, on the web, you can just go to the same website and vary the frequency and see pretty clearly that you get different modulations of that wave overlap and beat. Okay? Now, why, why am I doing this? Um, the reason I'm doing this is because what we're going to do next is extend these ideas so that we can think about the electron as being just a single one of these little packets right, and have some spatial confinement to it and thus look a little particle-like, right, while still a, having a wave nature to it. Okay, so it's just, again, a way to think about this, and you'll get more comfortable with it with time. Okay? Sorry. Um, so there we are. Now let's take the same equation that we did here, the one where we have our modulated amplitude and our overall sine wave um, there, and let's solve this for a couple cases. Right? If we take and say that the difference between the frequency of wave 1 and wave 2 and the difference between the wave vectors of wave 1 and wave 2 gets very, very, very small right, and goes to 0, then what we recover in our solution is an infinitely long wave packet, a monochromatic wave, an idea of an extended wave in space. All right, so this idea of you know, overlapping two, if the difference between the two becomes very small, it's as though we have a single wave spread throughout space. All right, so this same equation in this limit allows us to consider the electron as a wave. We can also go through and instead of having just the overlap of a single wave and another second wave, let's pretend that we sum a very, very, very large number of waves which have a very small difference in their frequency um, between all of these waves together. And what this will do, if you go through and look at the equations and, and use this type of an approach, sorry, I'm going to shut the door here, um, then what you'll find is that that allows you to spatially localize the electron, right, by having it described by a number of different wave functions and thus be controlled as a little area of space while still maintaining some wave-like character. So the reason to show you this is it's just a way to say that there's some way to think about having both a wave nature and a particle nature. In the case of the wave nature, the electron is spread out over space. In the case of the particle way of thinking about it, you can think about the electron as being composed of a large number of wave functions which cancel outside of this central wave packet, and you can kind of consider this little guy here to be the particle electron itself, all right? Now, is this accurate? No. Uh, is it correct? Mm, sort of, all right? But it's just a way of taking these equations and, and using them to think about the electron in both of these modes, all right? Um, and I don't want to dwell too much about it, go home and think about it a little bit, and yeah, maybe you'll at some point become comfortable with this idea too. But it's a good place to start with the overall process of this. Now, a couple of other things about electrons that we want to do. So I guess I'll stop at just this moment and ask the class if there's any questions on this. I mean, it's a, it's a bunch of odd ideas, but think about them. And really the point is that we have to always know that we're dealing with an electron which has this wave-particle duality, and we want to be comfortable with the idea that this isn't insane, that there's reasons that you can think about this and use it later on. Okay? Okay. All right. So a couple of other quick things about electrons before we get into the rest of it. I put these equations here just so you have them for the future. There'll be some points where in a homework or two you may want to have these equations written down in front of you. All right? Um, a couple of things to note is that in the case of, uh, of the 
transmission electron microscope, if we hold the electron source at some potential with respect to ground and it moves through the column, um, we can calculate from this um, the wavelength and uh, find out how that relates to the potential that's used to drive that electron down to the source. And so if we take an uh, electron that's held at 100 kilovolts, for example, and emit it from the tip and bring it down through the column, we can find out what the wavelength is. Um, it gets pretty fast, so in fact we have to use a relativistic correction. But the key result that comes out of this is that we have an ability to know for a given accelerating voltage, some things about the wavelength of the electron, um, some things about its velocity, and in particular its velocity with respect to the speed of light. All right, so a couple things to think about. Um, the machine that we're going to use during our labs is a 200 kV machine. You'll note that the wavelength is 0.02-ish angstrom, relativistically corrected, okay? Um, you'll note that it's moving at 70 times the, 70 percent, pardon me, the speed of light. So it's moving pretty quick, all right? If you go to a million volt machine, of which there are some around, um, you get towards extremely small wavelengths, right? That's on the order of nine picometers um, and almost the speed of light uh, as the thing moves through the column. I'll ask a question. Does anyone have any idea in a crystal structure such as aluminum, what's the average spacing between atoms or, or a representative spacing between atoms, say, down a, 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 a wide direction, 110 or 111? Is it nine picometers? Is it nine angstrom? Is it nine nanometers? Four angstrom. That's a guess of four angstrom. Is he right? That's on the order of the lattice spacing, right, which in aluminum will have the FCC centered. So it's more like 2.1 to 2.3-ish, okay? So about right, off by a factor of two, we'll give him that. So what this tells us, right, is that if we have a wavelength of, you know, even as down as, as, as 25 picometers, right, and a spacing that is um, two angstrom, right, so that's in... Da, 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 that's an angstrom. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's off by a, it's, it's 100 times better than what we might need. We should be able to do atomic level of resolution, right? Um, if we think about this in terms of uh, a classic resolution criteria, the Rayleigh criteria, right? This was developed for optical microscopy. It's just a, a simple resolution criteria, right? If we have something at 100 kV, for example, and 0.04 angstroms, we should be at more than enough resolution to see and discriminate between atoms, and we should have more than enough resolution to actually image the individual atomic cores without much problem. Um, the atomic core of something like carbon is on the order of 0.3 angstrom, and so the electron microscope should do a very good job of resolving things, right? And that was one of the motivations for creating it in the first place. Now, we do not routinely see this level of resolution in the TEM. We'll learn all the reasons why. But the primary one is that the lenses that we use are not perfect. And so we will discuss when we discuss lenses, aberrations, and how they limit resolution. And really, on a microscope such as the simple ones we'll use in lab, the resolution on that machine is on the order of 3 angstrom, okay? Not 0.03 angstrom, okay? So there's a big loss due to these aberrations um, on a typical machine. If you work very hard, you can get down to the two angstrom regime. If you spend a lot of money and add in a lot of aberration correcting lenses, you can now get down to 0.5 angstrom. That's the best that's been done as of two months ago, okay? October 2007. Um, so that's a, just a point of note. So that's a final comment on the electrons. And I pop this in here in your notes. Um, so before moving on any, any further, are there any questions about electrons or thoughts about electrons that you, you want to get into before we get into the main meat of sources and, and finding electrons? Anything at all? Please, some questions? Nothing? Nothing? Okay, great. So that must mean it's super clear and everyone's comfortable with wave-particle duality. What I want to do next now is we've talked a bit about electrons. It's an important thing to understand in the electron microscope where those electrons come from. Um, and how we create a reliable source of electrons and really what the important characteristics are um, for that process. So what I'm going to do over the next lecture here is describe the important source characteristics um, that we'll need to know at later points in the class. Um, we'll talk about the different types of electron sources that exist, um, how they work from a uh, physics perspective, 
how they work from a mechanics of creating the guns perspective. And then I'll briefly mention some things about measuring these properties at the end because there are times during the course of your experimentation where you may want to do that. Um, so before uh, getting into how they work, we, we need to think about some key parameters that we might want to know. Um, an obvious key parameter is brightness. If you think about just simply taking a digital camera, right, and trying to take an image with a digital camera of your friends, um, you know, out, outside at some point, if it's dark, you have insufficient brightness, your detector is not going to capture that image, right? Um, if you are using an optical microscope, right, and you forget to turn the light on on the optical microscope, you don't see a whole heck of a lot because you need to have some intensity, right, some number of photons in that case that are giving you something on the detector to see. So brightness is an obvious concern um, for the different types of electron sources and a key parameter. And it turns out that the different types of sources, the thermionic, Schottky, and cold field emission that I'll discuss later, have different types of brightnesses. Um, this one, the cold field emission, is the best. It's also the most expensive and most difficult to deal with. And so there's trade-offs to be had throughout. Another um, thing that you may be interested in is the temporal coherence. The temporal coherence has to do with the differences in the energy of the electrons as they're emitted from the source. I've already implied, right, that we have an electron sitting, coming off the source, being held at a voltage with respect to ground. That voltage I've discussed being on the order of 100 kilovolts, 200 kilovolts, right, pretty large numbers of voltage. Um, the thing is, <coughs> pardon me, at that voltage, the electron is going to have a particular wavelength, again, as I described in those couple of simple uh, uh, derivations earlier. And the question is, is if you have a voltage of 100 kilovolts, what happens if it's 100.1 or 100.2, right? That's going to change your wavelength, and you can sense then that that'll change a lot about how the microscope works, right? If you have a slightly different wavelength, then each of your lenses will focus a little bit differently, right? And so you're going to see some effects on your use of the microscope in terms of the temporal coherence um, of the source itself. And we'll talk about that in some detail. The other uh, point of note is what's called spatial coherence. If you are trying to use that electron source to illuminate your sample and the electron source is large, then it's more difficult to, say, focus it down to a small probe to do some uh, probing of the sample. For things like the scanning TEM mode, the idea is to have a very small electron probe that you raster back and forth across your sample. And so it's harder to get that very small probe if your source of electrons is quite large. Okay, so another key source characteristic is simply how big of an area is your electron source that you're dealing with, okay? All right, so those are the three major characteristics, so we'll move on and discuss those in a bit more detail. Um, brightness, it's an, it's an intuitively obvious idea, right? Something that's bright means you have more light in the case of photons. In the case of electrons, it's just more electrons, and the proper way to define that um, includes the current density of electrons, in other words, the number of electrons uh, coming out of an area, right, per unit solid angle. That's just a way to capture the fact that there's an angular distribution of those electrons as they come off of a source. Um, so the, the current density, right, must be the electrons per unit area per unit time, and this term brightness thus is defined in that mode. Um, it's, a, it's a specific definition. And, and just to share with you, uh, in the case of the electron sources that we are using, they turn out to be very bright. If you compare them to other types of sources of photons um, or neutrons, in fact, the cold field emission uh, mode of running the TEM, if you have one of those sources, is by far the brightest. Um, and that's in comparison with even um, X-ray sources such as those at the national labs that are based on synchrotron technology. So we have a very bright high intensity source, and that's a real advantage to the transmission electron microscope. Um, some properties that we'll discuss um, at later points when talking about probe size and the like is the diameter of the beam, right? Simple, right? Because that is again going to be related to the spatial coherence. Um, the current, because again that has to do with the brightness, that's the emission current coming off of the actual filament itself. And the angle of divergence 
forms a uh, parameter that we'll use to describe how much convergence and divergence we get through the different lenses as we talk forward. So again, this is one to maybe return to at a later point once we start to use the microscope. And in an optimal mode of use, you're going to be learning how to turn the filament on, how to bring it to emission, how to align um, the system so that you get the smallest beam diameter with the highest level of emission current, right? Smallest beam diameter, highest level of emission current, largest brightness, okay? So that's one of the goals we'll have from an overview, okay? Um, it is the key parameter when thinking about the electron gun. When we work on the machine, we're going to work to optimize the brightness um, by using a couple of different alignments. Um, the reason it's such an important parameter is that it impacts almost all aspects of using the microscope. When your filament gets old in a thermionic microscope, for example, it takes longer to take pictures. You have less electrons coming down and hitting the film. You end up taking longer exposure times. You can see drift. These are problems. If you're trying to do uh, analytical work where you're trying to get lots and lots of, say, x-rays to count, to do your chemical determination, and you have fewer electrons coming in, you'll have fewer x-rays coming out, and you'll have a harder time getting the analytical data that you would like. Um, the numbers that come out of this, the difference between these three types of, uh, of, uh, of sources, um, there's pretty substantial differences between this one in particular, the cold field emission, and the thermionic. And that's a pretty large difference in the amount of brightness. And so what this tells you to first order is that if you have the opportunity to use a cold field emission machine and you are extremely concerned with something like analytical work, that may be the right thing for you to do. Okay? So we'll, we'll think about that further. Um, of course, these turn out to be, unfortunately, much more expensive to build and to operate and much testier. Otherwise, that's the only thing we'd be talking about. All right? Right? I wouldn't be showing you the least performing thing unless it was important. And the reason it's important is because we can afford them more frequently. OK? OK. Um, a little note here. Um, my edition of the text has a, a small error in the definition of the solid angle. So you know, go through and, and use this one if, if you have an older edition. Um, I think that has been corrected in the latest edition of the Williams and Carter text. OK? Now, temporal coherence, um, as I mentioned, is the one that has to do with uh, differences in energy. Essentially, what you would like your electrons to be is a single wavelength of electrons coming off of the source. Um, what happens is due to um, instabilities within the system, you end up with some spread of the relative energies of the electrons. And essentially, what this gives you is a bit of color right, or variation in wavelength to the electrons. It's essentially analogous to color, right? We know that monochromatic light is composed of wavelengths between 250 nanometers to 200, or 750 nanometers or so of different um, wavelengths of the light. In this case, we're looking at very small amounts of difference in energy, but it's an important thing. Um, this can be described as something called the coherence length, which really just takes into account this difference in energy and, and gives you a sense as to the uh, problems associated with differences in wavelength. That's another way that this is often characterized in the field. Um, typical numbers for a tungsten uh, thermionic gun, um, which we do have on our 2000 EX downstairs, um, this number is around 3 EV. And that is on top of 200 to 300 keV, right? So it's not a large amount, right? I mean, one part in 100,000. but because of the extreme sensitivity of the instrument and the things we're trying to accomplish, it affects it rather substantially. You do not get atomic resolution with a tungsten thermionic machine. Okay, it's very, very difficult. If you instead use what's called a lanthanum hexaboride cathode, this gets to a lower number of around 1 eV. If you use what's called Schottky field emission down to 0.8 eV, and then again, this very nice mode of what's called cold field emission gets down to 0.3 eV, and that's pretty good. Now, this has an additional large impact in the area of electron energy loss spectroscopy. You'll recall that I mentioned we can use and characterize the amount of energy loss that the incident electron has with the sample as a way to characterize the chemistry, and importantly, to, uh, to characterize bonding. And so you'll recall last time I showed those edges and the wiggles after the edges. Well, if you superimpose 3 eV of distortion on that wiggle, 
right, versus 0.3 eV, you learn very little from that wiggle, right, at 3 eV of noise distortion, whereas if you have a 0.3 eV level of resolution on that, you can do very nice work in terms of understanding the bonding states. At present in the field, for those people working in that area and pushing on that type of spectroscopy, there are some people that are going with the cold field emission route. Um, the Hitachi Corporation is, I believe, reintroducing that type of technology. There is a small company called Nyon, um, where Andre Krivonik is building these types of machines uh, which have cold field emission. Um, the larger manufacturers of TEMs, uh, FEI and JUL, um, are instead adding an additional set of optics after the source so that what they do is they take a Schottky field emission that has 0.8 eV spread and they put what's called a monochromator in it and they throw away some of the electrons and take the sweet spot in the middle and that has been proven down to I believe 0.18 eV last I heard, okay? I think that number's about right. So those are pretty good numbers, all right? It turns out that, um, as we'll get into in the spectroscopy, um, 0.3 eV is really kind of good enough to do most things. Um, the types of spectroscopies people are looking at are core loss spectroscopies usually, and at around 0.3, um, I'm told that that's about as good as you need to do. If we were to somehow um, push down, have a, a much brighter source someday where we got down to 0.0, O, a point, uh, zero, 0.01 EV-ish or so, we'd be able to compete with some surface ion spectroscopies and being doing plasmon spectroscopies. It would open up a really big new area, but that's something for later on in the field. So this is just to give you a sense as to why these things are important. So again, we will use a lanthanum hexaboride machine within this class, and then in 640 when we talk about high-resolution imaging, we'll go over and use the Titan, which uses a Schottky field emission, okay? Which you actually usually run a little bit hotter, so it's around 1, you know, 0.9, okay? It depends on how you want to run it. Okay, the final characteristic of note is spatial coherency. Um, again, this has to do with how big um, the uh, source of the electrons is. Ideally, you'd like to have a source that is infinitesimally small, so that the only thing broadening that source as it comes down to your sample to form a small probe is, say, aberrations in the lenses, all right? But in fact, you don't quite get that. Um, you have an effective source size that has to do with the wavelength, that has to do with the angle of divergence. You work on these things to get a more coherent source. Um, generally, to improve the spatial coherency, what people will do is they will um, try to have a smaller physical source. In the case of the field emission sources, you'll see some pictures of these later. Um, they're actually physically emitting from a smaller crystal. Um, you want to go to then a higher wavelength, and so it does help to have a higher voltage. Um, there's trade-offs there, though, too. And then again, you want to have a lower angle of, uh, of divergence, and so you'll have a smaller aperture. But then if you have a smaller aperture, you throw some electrons away and you have to compromise brightness. So there's, again, some trade-offs in all of this, right? Um, improved spatial coherency is a good thing. It demonstrably helps high-resolution imaging. If you have uh, poor spatial coherency, then it shows up as blur in the image. Um, it gives you sharper diffraction patterns. It gives you better diffraction contrast images. And I will add another bullet here um, that I should have added, which is it also is important when trying to form very small probes um, for doing analytical work and for doing high angle annular dark field stem. Okay? Um, so based on all of these things that we've talked about, right, I've said that if you look, um, right, the brightness is best from a cold field emission source, right, by far. I've said that the temporal coherency is best with a cold field emission source, right? I've said that the spatial coherency has to do with an effective source size, and I didn't say it explicitly, but again, the ones coming off of the FEG are very small, so you get good spatial coherency. So the answer is very clear, right? You just buy a field emission source, and preferably a cold field emission source, right? And you're, you, all these things are optimized. The problem is, is that if you take a given microscope um, and add on the cold field emission option, that's a number, it's about right, um, of how much more you pay, okay? And that's not a small number. Um, that represents the earnings of much of us for a career, well, you know, around that, right, um, depending on what you do. So it's a big number. And so you have to have a strong need for that additional capability. Um, it also turns out that it's not just the initial purchase that gets complicated, um, but the maintenance contracts on the field emission sources are substantially larger. Um, you pay usually 
uh, in, you know, now it's 2008 dollars, something on the order of an extra $50,000 or so a year service contract for one of these. Um, and so you do want to think about that before you go and tell your boss at your job that you must have a FEG, okay? Um, but you may, right? If you are in a position where analytical work is your key point, then you have an, an entirely good reason to, to, to think about that, okay? Um, now, another thing about the field emission source that's, that's interesting, we will learn about this in detail later in the class. It turns out that field emission sources give you, um, because of the higher spatial coherency, um, because of the overall improvement of the electron sources, you can get more resolution out of your machine in the high resolution imaging mode. Problem is, is that resolution is not always interpretable. And what, what does that mean? It means that the picture you're taking takes more work to figure out what it says, okay? We'll have a whole series of lectures about interpreting these types of images, and the field emission sources make it a bit more complicated. So, you know, again, you have to think about whether that's what you want. Here at Purdue, we have a field emission source for doing very high resolution work. We also now have a Lab 6 2000, uh, you know, thermionic type machine that has about two angstrom, and every picture you take is directly interpretable. So we're, some people, that's exactly what they need. They don't need to have one angstrom resolution. They need two angstrom resolution, and that's the right machine for them because it's easier to interpret. And again, for those of you all sticking through the 640, you'll learn in detail how that all comes about. Also, with the field emission source, because it has a smaller uh, initial source size, actually as you spread that beam to form an image in low magnification, it's actually dimmer. Even though the brightness, right, which is current density per solid angle, is higher in the FEG, once you spread that out, it turns out to be lower in that case. And so if you are doing uh, low magnification imaging, which you may do for certain types of metallurgical microscopy, for example, uh, material science microscopies, it may in fact be a less intense source for you, and it's something to consider. Um, if you're doing dynamic imaging in particular, that can be a problem, okay? So there's some reasons to, 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 to go through and understand these things. Again, we will get on the microscope in the lab classes and understand this by, by looking at brightness, how we optimize it, and getting a sense for it, okay? A final one that's important is the stability of the high voltage power supply that's providing these electrons, right? So I said we hold the electron source at 100 kilovolts with respect to ground, 200 kilovolts with respect to ground, so that we bring these electrons down through the column at high velocity with a lot of energy. Um, ideally, right, if you were to have a, uh, a source that was, that was not uh, perfectly stable, that would again introduce temporal coherence I'm bringing this out as a separate topic because it has to do not with the source characteristic per se, but rather with the voltage that's applied to that source. So it is a slightly different topic. Um, in the case of the modern TEM, you'll get something like one part per million of ripple or deviation from 100 kV. If you uh, want to have a super good microscope, you will try to push that down to uh, 0.1 part per million, right, in order to have a very precise voltage and thus a very precise wavelength, okay? Additionally, even though this is rippling at a given uh, voltage, it will drift with time too, and that's problematic again because as you set up your alignments, these things can drift over periods and your alignments will go wrong, okay? And again, these are remarkable numbers in some ways, right? 0.1 parts per million, right, on top of 200 keV. Um, when we start to look at the microscopes, they're big, the guns are big, there's this big tank in the back that has to do with keeping all this stuff up, and you'll start to get an appreciation as for why these things are so big and expensive, because this technology is not straightforward, okay? And it's always being pushed. Um, in the case of the stabilities, it turns out that the thermionic guns are more stable generally than the cold fegs. Um, and the shockies are somewhere in between, especially with respect to the drifts. Uh, if you have a cold FEG machine, it will drift from the moment you clean it. We'll, we'll learn why you need to clean it. It'll drift down with time, and so the stabilities are a little bit less with the cold FEG than they are with the thermionic, okay? So those are the primary source characteristics to worry about. And again, as we get on the microscope, we'll learn more uh, about what we're seeing and how they relate to brightness, which is current density per solid angle, as they relate to temporal coherence, right? How much variation in the electron wavelength is there? What's the nature of the source size itself? And then also some issues with stability. So we'll look at those four things as we use the microscope. And again, as you actually work, 
at the highest levels of resolution, you find yourself balancing these different issues to get the best pictures, okay? Now, we've talked about electron sources. How do we actually get electrons out of these sources? So this is the emission physics portion of it, and I'll go ahead and, and, and go through this to, to finish up today's lecture portion um, on, on this stuff, okay? Um, I'm hoping <coughs> that everyone's familiar with the concept of work function. Anyone not heard that term in the classroom? Okay, great. Right? So the work function simply describes how much energy is required to remove an electron from a crystal. Um, it's done usually as a descriptor, as a band diagram. So if we have a material with electrons up to the Fermi energy, the work function is the amount of energy required to overcome the barrier presented by the crystal itself um, to emission into the vacuum. Okay? Um, there's an addition to this, the Schottky effect. That's a, a, an effect that comes out of the simple electrostatics of this. If you have a charge at a boundary, you have to consider an image charge outside that boundary. Again, for those of you all that have taken uh, electromagnetism classes, this is a very familiar idea. But basically what it does is it, it helps to lower that barrier a little bit or modify the nature of that barrier. And so in thermionic emission, the idea there is we're supplying all the energy that's needed to remove the electron from the crystal by simply heating it up. Okay? So if we take a crystal and hold it very, very, very hot, there's a thermal distribution of the energies of the electrons, right? And at some point we have enough energy provided that they start to have enough energy to leave the crystal, right? And if we hold the electron source at a potential with respect to ground, the moment they leave that crystal, zoom, they'll go to ground, okay? So the idea is that we take a filament, we hold it very hot until we overcome the work function. The electrons are emitted. They're held at 200 kilovolts with respect to ground, and zoom, they run down our microscope. OK? That's the idea. In the SEM, 30 kV, OK? But in the TEM, something like 200 kV. Um, just as a, as a comment, this can be described by Richardson's law. If anyone wants to look into that, you can. The important points, though, is that it's a function of temperature. It's a function of the surface condition and surface crystallography in terms of what the value of the work function is. And really, the amount of current you get depends exponentially on changes in this work function. And if you have a factor of, uh, of a, a T change, it can yield a very large factor of increase in the emission. The types of materials that are used for doing thermionic emission include the tungsten emitter and, more modernly, lanthanum hexaboride and cerium hexaboride. Um, you can see why lanthanum hexaboride and cerium hexaboride, these are kind of strange ceramic crystals, right? But wow, that's a big lowering of the work function, right? So that means for a fairly equivalent temperature, you're going to get a whole lot more emission, all right? So the machines that we use here, and most machines these days in the case of the TEMs, will use either a lanthanum hexaboride or a cerium hexaboride um, emitter, OK? Um, the temperatures are actually lower, which is uh, nice as well. And the, we'll see the emission, how the whole thing works in terms of the, of the equipment in a minute. But really, lanthanum hexaboride has become fairly standard. Um, also, if you have a tungsten emitter, the lifetimes are only on the order of about 200 hours before you have to replace them. It's like a, basically the idea is, is not so dissimilar to, uh, to a light bulb filament, right? You just run a lot of current through a light bulb filament. You get light out. You get a lot of heat out. Right? You run, there's also some electrons that come out, and if you put a voltage there, boom, on they go down to the column. Okay? Um, but it does wear out. The lanthanum hexaborides last longer. The cerium hexaborides last even longer. And these things tend to be a bit cheaper than those, a bit more expensive than those. And so it depends on how you're using your microscope. Um, if you are concerned about cost, cost, cost of operation, you may find that you use the tungstens right, and replace them more frequently, especially if you're using a microscope in an environment where it doesn't get used a lot. Right? In a user center like a university or a national lab, people will tend to use the lanthanum hexaboride because they don't have to be changed as often. And they are, in fact, a much better performing machine, as we saw from the characteristics before. Okay? Um, the reason that there is a lifetime is basically if you hold this thing hot, not only are electrons coming off, but atoms are too. All right? And so eventually the thing just sputters away. And whenever one of these things needs replaced, um, you open up the gun, you pull the thing out, um, you pull out the, the main, uh, the main uh, focusing optics called the Vanehelt cup. We'll learn about that in a minute. Um, and you look and you find it's covered with crud. And that crud is your filament. And uh, right, because you've 
basically boiled off not only the electrons for your use, but the atoms come along with it for the ride. Okay? Um, interestingly, I used to run a, a 1.5 million volt machine out at Berkeley, um, and there the electron gun was shifted by, I think it was about two millimeters away from the main column, and they had a, a little electrostatic lens that took the electrons and deviated them, right, as it went down the column. That way the electrons could come down and be just fine, and the atoms that came off at that high accelerating voltage, right, did not come running down the column and hit your sample. And instead they just had a piece of lead there that captured all of those, okay? And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing, because otherwise, not only would you be using electrons to interrogate your sample, you'd have the occasional really heavy tungsten atom come down and bang into your sample and do dramatic damage, okay? That's a little less of a problem in the lower voltage range beams. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, um, field emission. The idea with the field emission is to do one more thing. Instead of simply taking your electron uh, source and heating it so that you have a sufficient amount of energy for those electrons to leave the material, um, you now apply a field local to that source, right? And that electrical field is um, going to drop, right, the amount of energy required. So if you take what was the Schottky shape, right, and you apply an external field of some magnitude, then what you're going to get as your true barrier is this one here, okay? And the idea is you go through and provide a sufficiently strong field that instead of actually having it so that you not only lower the amount of energy required, you shorten and, and, and physically shorten that barrier that the electrons can quantum mechanically tunnel out, okay? So this is called field emission. The idea is that you are applying a sufficiently high local field to the electron source that you lower the barrier, you shorten the barrier uh, region over which it's active, and the electrons say, ah, I'd rather be over here. Statistically, probabilistically, often enough, right? Um, tunnel out through the other side, and there you go. And again, you know, for those of you that haven't had a quantum mechanics class or a solid state physics class, you may have heard of tunneling, right? It's the same phenomena that's used in scanning tunneling microscopy, right? And here we're just using it to get electrons out of this thing. And the thing that's nice about this is by doing this, um, there is actually a, a much lower, um, basically what happens is by putting this high field on this, um, there's going to be very few electrons that make it out at this energy right below where I have, say, that vector drawn there, because the probability gets very low. And it takes a very, you know, it doesn't, from the nature of, of, of tunneling, it's, there's a point where, oh, okay, oh, then all of a sudden, as the barrier gets close enough, the probability goes up pretty quickly, right? And what that means is it means that the changes in energy um, associated with the field emission electrons are pretty small, right? Because it's uh, below that point, not going to make it, not going to make it, oh, all of a sudden, hey, and then boom, everything probabilistically makes it to the other side of energies above this point. And so really what that means is you are getting a very nice um, uh, delta E on your source. There's two types of field emission sources. The Schottky field emission source is one where you use a combination of temperature and applied field. Um, in the case of the cold field emission source, you hold the thing at room temperature and just suck the electrons off with a high electric field, okay? Um, this then leads to an even finer, right, temporal coherence. That's why you get the 0.3 EV on that. In this case, there's a thermal broadening to that. That's why it extends out to 0.8 EV, 0.9 EV, right, because you're adding this temperature on top of the field to pull the electrons out. Um, the one thing that's nice about the Schottky is that when you're using uh, the cold FEG, you have to have ultra high vacuum, okay? Because the thing's cold, right? If you're in a moderately okay vacuum, right? Something like 10 to the minus six tor, we know that there's gonna be enough crap in that vacuum that you'll form a monolayer of crap on the source, right? Within a second, okay? Um, and if you take this diagram here and put a monolayer of crap on that diagram, then all of a sudden it's harder to tunnel through, right? Because not only are you tunneling through the barrier associated with the work function, you've also got a new work function barrier there associated with the crud that's built up on your source, okay? So in the case of the cold field emission, you have to have <coughs> something like 10 to the minus 10 tor to keep it nice and clean, right? And that's where the expense comes in. You have to have a lot of ion pumps, a very uh, good vacuum system, tight vacuum system to make a cold field emission source work. 
in the case of the Schottky, you keep this thing pretty hot, right? Still at 1800 degrees Kelvin. And so you don't use a bad vacuum here, right? You're still operating down 10 to the minus 9 uh, tor. Um, but the difference between 10 to the minus 9 and, and low 10 to the minus 10s for anyone who doesn't do vacuum work, it's a lot of work, okay? I mean, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 doesn't sound like a big deal. It's a big deal to do that, okay? And so you hold this thing hot, and thus when the crap comes in, the crap also boils off, okay? So the idea is that you're able to keep uh, the field emission characteristics working much better, all right? So that's the reason the Schottky is a better choice um, for many occasions. And really, you only want to do this cold fag if you're if your area of research is dealing with bonding characteristics in stem and eels, for example, okay? Or you really want to do lots of EDS work, okay? Much like the, uh, I'm going to finish right here with this uh, final section, much like the, 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 the thermionic sources, there's an equation, there's this fellow Nordheim, I just put it up there, and you see again it has to do with work functions and the like. And there's a distribution for all of these cases that's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, that's no surprise, and at that point we'll stop on the emission physics for today, okay? So thank you for your attention. The, where we were last time, right, is we were talking about electron sources. So what we were doing is we were talking about um, the characteristics of an electron source, and we started to talk about the physics of how it works. Um, so last time when we had this, uh, the first half of this lecture, we discussed what were some of the primary source characteristics for an electron source. And they were associated with um, the brightness of the electron source, which is uh, defined as the current density per solid angle. In other words, how many electrons are coming off of the source um, as defined with a, with a number per area per solid angle. We also talked about two types of coherency, the temporal coherency and the spatial coherency, each of which have an effect on the way that you can get the data out of the microscope and the performance of the microscope. And then the next thing we did is we talked about the different source types. We talked about thermionic, Schottky field emission, and cold field emission. A thermionic being simply providing enough heat to the source in order to get uh, the electrons to have sufficient energy to overcome the work function and be emitted. Um, Schottky field emission uses the imposition of a high local electric field to lower that barrier, and the electrons then tunnel through the barrier. This gives you a, a tighter spread on the electron emission. And then the final one being cold field emission, where you simply use a high extraction voltage to get the electrons to come out. And so what I want to do today is actually just describe how these guns work very briefly. And then um, I'm going to point you to the fact that you can measure all these properties, but it's uh, not something to get into in detail. And so instead, I'll refer you to the text if you ever get to that. So let's go through now and swing down to where we were, which was uh, finishing up with the different types of electron sources, right? We had talked about the emission physics for thermionic and for Schottky, and finally for the cold field emission. Um, and I believe we finished last time right around here, OK? So uh, in summary, looking at these things, we have the, the four primary types that you have. You have a tungsten, uh, a lab six. These are both categories of thermionic, just different types of emitters. The Schottky field emission and the cold field emission. And again, you can see that there's um, a improvement in brightness, an improvement in the temporal coherence, an improvement in the spatial coherence as you go down this column. The issue, of course, is that as you go down into the cold fag situation, you need to be in very high vacuum, and it complicates uh, the creation of a good stable source, OK? Um, really, when people are doing conventional TEM for looking at diffraction patterns, for characterizing grain structure, dislocations, and the like, a uh, lanthanum hexaboride type machine is now pretty much the most common one that you'll use. In the case of uh, conventional uh, analytical work, and by conventional, I mean um, doing EDS, doing EELS, doing energy filtered imaging in most laboratories. You'll do this with a Schottky field emission microscope. And that, of course, should be a G here. I apologize, the cold FEG. Um, if you are someone who is dedicated to doing analytical work at the very high end of science, then you may, in fact, use a cold FEG. So those are really the three primary types. And again, the cost increases as you go down the column. Um, now, it's worth kind of putting this, uh, these sorts of numbers within a context. Um, and you'll see this table frequently in the class because I like it. It's one that I stole from John Spence, who's a professor at Arizona State. Um, and he put together a table that, that, that compares the three primary types of uh, radiation sources that are used to probe a material, neutrons, x-rays, and electrons, and compared a couple of different things across them. And this table was accurate as of two or three years ago. Um, the neutrons may have gone up with the spallation neutron source coming online. But you can still see that as you go and define as uh, source brightness as the number of particles, either neutrons, photons, or electrons, 
um, per area, per stair radian, you end up having a dramatic increase in the brightness as you go from neutrons to electrons. And in fact, the electrons are very, very bright, giving lots and lots of intensity. Um, and that's a great thing for analytical work amongst others because you really want to have lots of electrons to probe your sample. Additionally, you can look at this here, the elastic mean free path. We'll talk a lot about elastic scattering, but just to give you a sense, this refers to how far does this particle travel through your material before it scatters off of a single atom, okay? And so this does provide a, an interesting comparison. In the case of neutrons, you can go through rather large amounts of materials before you see any scattering. And that's their real advantage, right, is you can look through very thick things. Um, in the case of x-rays, you can still through look through pretty thick pieces of material and get very good uh, single scattering type events. In the case of electrons, though, we're down into the very small scale regime. If you are talking about a uh, 300 kV electron, you can go through about you know, 200 angstroms of something normalish, aluminumish, uh, to uh, have a single scattering event. And so you can look at this as being bad, right? It means you have to have a very, very thin sample to do electron microscopy. Or you can look at it as being very good, because it means you have lots of opportunities for scatter, right? If you want to think about creating x-rays or electrons. Mostly it's kind of bad, but you can spin it good in your mind if you want. Um, this absorption length is actually uh, quite related to that. And then the final thing that's interesting is, is the minimum probe size. And again, as an electron microscopist, we like to point out these two things in particular. Look, we've got a lot of electrons, and boy, we can focus them to a very small probe size, right? Whereas uh, neutrons, um, that's a big number, right? Um, so it's not as though you can do the same sorts of works with these other types of radiation sources. The electron source, coming from the prejudice of being an electron microscopist, right? It's a very great way of doing um, these sorts of scattering experiments. It's bright, can be focused to a small probe, and has lots of interaction. Um, I have read this, and, and I think that still is correct. The cold field emission electron source is the brightest continuous radiation source known in the universe, defined as we define it, being the number of particles per area per stair radian. And so that's a pretty interesting sort of thing. So the next time you're using one of these machines, you know, there you are with the brightest radiation source in the universe in your lab, okay? Um, also, um, because of the high spatial and temporal coherency, you can focus these electrons down to very, very small probes. Um, the best published result is still, I believe, 0.78 angstrom. Um, I think there's some uh, data on the web now down at, at 0.6 to maybe even 0.55 angstrom from the latest machines. So again, this is a, a very nice fact. Uh, and so these electron sources are giving you very large numbers of electrons that can be focused down to very small pro uh, probes. And that's a very useful thing for doing science, OK? OK. Now, a caveat to that is um, we've got lots of energy, right? We're putting 300 kV electrons, right? We're focusing them down to, say, an angstrom, right, onto a sample. And we're doing this continuously and taking, oh, you know, a several second image. Um, lots of energy being put into the sample. There's lots of potential for damaging your sample as a result, OK? So one thing that you have to be continuously aware of in the electron microscopy uh, type of work is that you can do a lot of specimen damage if you're not careful. So the, the disadvantage to these other things which are great is you have to be aware of how they may or may not affect your sample, OK? You could drill holes through things pretty easily. Um, you can uh, really put a lot of point defects, and those can agglomerate into line defects, and on and on and on. In fact, um, during the early stages of transmission electron microscopy, there were multiple million volt machines built primarily for the purpose of looking at radiation damage. It turns out that if you take a, a metal sample and stick it in a high voltage machine, um, the amount of damage that accumulates from the electron intensity coming in is uh, equivalent to many, many, many years of gamma radiation coming from a nuclear reactor. And so prior to uh, Three Mile Island in this country, there was a lot of uh, work being done in radiation damage using electron microscopy because of this fact. And uh, there's an interesting plot I saw once that plotted the number of high voltage microscopes installed in America versus the number of nuclear reactors installed in America. And they, they you know, followed along nicely until the moment of the Three Mile Island accident, and then both of them kind of stopped. There's only been, I think, two that were installed, neither of which is working. No, one of which is working now. The Wadsworth one's still working. But it's just an interesting fact that the radiation damage you can get can be used to understand radiation damage. And 
Um, to go political for a moment, uh, if we actually find uh, leaders in this country that would like to fund science again at some point in the future, you may see high voltage microscopes come back to study these issues, but certainly not with the funding climate we've seen this year. Okay, done with political. Um, if you're interested, the American Physical Society right now has on their website letters that you might sign to your Congress members to discuss how displeased you are with how that's going. It's just up to you. Um, but it's pretty bad. I don't know if you know that or not. They basically have cut out tremendous amounts of funding this year. Um, they're, they're, it's terrible. Anyway, so moving on to electron guns and how they work. And yes, I am going political. All right. So the thermionic gun, right, the idea, again, physics-wise, is that you're taking the source, you are heating the source so that you provide sufficient amount of electrons for those electrons to leave the source um, via uh, thermal energy. Um, the way that we do this is we take our uh, filament, either tungsten or, say, lanthanum hexaboride, and we heat it to high temperature. We do this by just applying a current to it directly if it's tungsten. Lanthanum hexaboride is a ceramic, so you cannot apply a current to it directly. Instead, what you do is you mount that on top of a tungsten filament, and you heat the tungsten filament, and that gradually warms up the lanthanum hexaboride, okay? And so there's two different ways that you do this, but the general idea is you provide sufficient temperature to get the electrons to come off. And then what you do is you hold that filament at a potential with respect to ground, um, 100 kV, 200 kV, 300 kV, a million volts. Um, there's even a 3 million volt microscope in Japan. And that potential is what's used to accelerate the electrons down through the, uh, the TEM column and provide you, you know, the, the incident radiation to uh, probe your sample and do your work. Um, additionally, what we do right local to the sample is there's a thing called the Veinhelt cup. Um, it's essentially just a simple electrostatic lens. And what it does is it takes and focuses the electrons that come off of the probe into a point. And so we go from having a uh, point of emission to what's a new point source of electrons um, coming out focused by the action of this vein held cup. And so one of the things that your uh, primary operator of the microscope will do is make sure that the vein held cup bias is appropriately set in order to provide a good small crossover of these electrons as they come off of the, the tip. Um, in that case, at Purdue, that means me. Okay, every once in a while I go down and make sure that the bias on the vein held is appropriate to extract things. It also changes with time. As I mentioned last class, as the electrons come off, sometimes the ions come off too. Um, eventually this thing will just nub its way down to the bottom of the support. And if, you, if we have a good class and everyone learns how to align things properly, you'll actually find that there's just a wee tiny crystal left at the end because you've worn it all the way down. Um, and again, what happens is as that thing moves physically, right, then you're going to have to change the, the voltage on this uh, biasing cup in order to look at the right place, right, and focus that into a new probe uh, point, okay? So really the first lens in the microscope is an electrostatic lens. It's this vein held cup that's used to take the electrons as they're boiled off by thermionic emission um, and focus them down to a point at a gun crossover outside of the gun uh, lens, okay? Okay, so um, if you are interested here, there's a little link to a simulation uh, that you can go to on your own, and it'll show you how as you change the vein help bias, these things change, and, and it's useful to go through and do so. If you have a chance, please do so, okay? This is what these two types of guns look like. Um, the tungsten hairpin filament, they call it, okay? And it looks right, okay? It looks just uh, like a, a safety clip, on the image here, this is a scanning electron microscope image of this. And again, the idea is you run a current through it until it gets hot. Um, as you increase the current, you begin to see emission off of the corners here, as well as the tip. As you eventually bring more and more current through this, these things come to what's called saturation, where all of the electrons are preferentially coming off of that tip or corner of that hairpin filament. And that's the desired point. Okay. In the case of a lanthanum hexaboride, in the case of the lanthanum hexaboride filament, this thing is glued onto a larger piece of tungsten. You heat the tungsten, and then this thing gradually warms up, and you get a sufficient amount of temperature in it to get the emission to occur. Now, that's a key point. In the case of the lanthanum hexaboride filament, if you were to go from room temperature to 1600 degrees K necessary for uh, emission in a single step, 
um, the material scientists in the crowd might have a thought as to what would happen. Lior, what would happen if you went from zero to 1600K in a ceramic like that? It would crack, okay? And actually, it usually will crack at the joint between them, all right? So when we turn on the lanthanum hexaboride filament in the TEM, we do not whoop, turn it all the way up. We instead slowly warm it up in a series of steps. Um, most places, such as this one, are conservative about that and will tell you, you know, go to step one on the filament emission, wait a minute. Step two, wait a minute. Step three, wait a minute. And, and that's uh, just to make sure that you have a large amount of time for things to gradually warm up and you don't blow this filament off. Now, um, they're a couple thousand bucks a piece, so if you break one, it's a bummer. Um, we have to replace it. That's a fair amount of money. Um, the other thing that's important in that, too, is it's time, right? So not only will you lose your session, but it will take a couple of days to replace that, pump it out, realign it, make sure everything's good. And so a number of other people will lose their session as well. Um, it's not worth shortcutting that. It seems tedious to wait five minutes, seven minutes to warm up the filament. Do not shortcut that. Do it, OK? Um, and if you don't do that and things break, um, usually we will give you a, a chance to redeem yourself, but probably not too, okay? So we do try to take care of things. But again, this is what these things look like. As the lanthanum hexaboride warms up, you see first a uh, penumbra, would be the correct word, of emission coming from the outer ring of this. Um, actually, sometimes you'll start to see it come off of the four corners first. And then gradually, as you increase the heat, um, the emission will preferentially come off of the tip and that's, again, what we're looking for. In a well-aligned microscope, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these types of emission patterns as we gradually heat the filament up. And we're going to see that we have, say, equal intensity on either side of this hairpin or equal intensity around this ring. And that's going to be a sign of the fact that we're looking straight onto the tip of that filament. Okay? If that filament is fixed in space and we look at it from the side, we should expect to see preferential emission from one side of the filament. And so if we see a picture of the filament on our fluorescent screen that's giving us images of electrons that shows that things are round and equal intensity, we're happy. We know that we are looking in the right place. And by looking, what I mean is it means that the first set of electrostatic lenses that are used to take that emission, right, and bring it down the column are aligned properly to do so, OK? So that's the first thing we'll do. In our first lab next week, we're going to start off with the microscope, and I'll turn the gun on, and we'll look at that. And that'll be about enough for the first lab. We'll go through and talk about how the microscope works, look at all the parts, and then look at the emission and get used to that, OK? OK. Um, it's also worth noting that you know, there's, there's a sense sometimes in, in things that, OK, if, if the desire is more electrons, then the thing to do is to run it really, really hot. OK, right? You run it hot, 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 you'll get more electrons off. Well, it actually doesn't work like that. Because of the way that the uh, Vanehelt cup used uh, to focus that works, um, there's actually a perfect point of saturation where you get, in fact, the single smallest source size the best coherency, and thus the best images. And so there is a point where you will bring the filament heating up until you achieve the best emission of electrons, and you will not go any further. If you go further, you lose performance, and um, you start to get more ions coming off, and the thing sputters away more quickly. So there's no gain to it, all right? So one of the things we will learn is what saturation looks like. In fact, if you're using a lanthanum hexaboride machine um, to do high resolution imaging, you will tend to go just slightly below that perfect saturation because you get a little bit better coherency. And as we'll learn in the high resolution section of the class, that can give you just a little bit better resolution. And so sometimes you'll actually go just a little lower and take a longer exposure. It depends on how good your room is. All these things we'll figure out as we go forward, OK? But again, there's no point in overheating the filament. There's a perfect position for the filament saturation. I'll show it to you. You'll learn how to do it yourself. If for some reason you, know, you come into the microscope and as you, you turn the filament up to that perfect point, it doesn't look saturated, that means that someone, me, needs to go back and readjust the bias, OK? When that happens, it's useful to receive an email Right? You can send an email out to the mailing list, which you will all become a part of, that says, it appears that the vein help bias is not set properly. I'll respond, or one of the senior graduate students may respond. Okay? Uh, there's two or three people who know how to do this as well. Okay? 
Okay, so that's the, the thermionic gun. In the case of the field emission gun, um, it's actually easier to use because in the cold field emission um, and uh, in the Schottky field emission, what you do is you uh, get the thing uh, installed, you bake the thing out, you turn the thing on, you optimize things, and you just leave it on, okay? And so when you're ready to work, you hit a button that opens a valve and the electrons come out. Okay, that's really nice. Uh, it's it's uh, even though it's a more complicated system, they just keep it running. By keeping it running, in the case of the Schottky, you keep it hot, and so there's less crap that can come down and deposit on it. Right? If this thing's sitting at 1600 degrees K, then it's or I guess it's 1800 I think for the zirconium oxide ones. Anyway, if it's that hot, um, the molecules that may be floating around are going to have a hard time adsorbing uh, to that surface, and so it keeps things clean. Um, so in the older microscopes, that means um, the 2100 F series from uh, Joel, the CM and Techni series from FEI, uh, those are the ones I'm familiar with that are FEGS, um, you, you may have to go through and, and do one final thing, which is to slowly increase the extraction voltage. So here's how this thing would work. You have your field emission tip sitting at a point. This anode stays in a particular position, and then you slowly bring up the extracting voltage um, V1 here so that you start to extract the electrons off. So let me say this right again. Second anode stays fixed. First anode is one that you will change just to go through and bring this thing up. In the more modern microscopes, such as uh, the Titan uh, over at Burke, all you do is just turn it on. They just have that all fixed up for you, okay? Um, which is nice. Now, if you go through and use the microscope in different imaging modes between analytical or high resolution, there's times where you want to have better coherency. There's times where you want to have better brightness. You will adjust sometimes the first and second anode. Um, these are called gun lenses. And again, it just allows you to choose whether you want more electrons or a finer spread of energy on the electrons. But it's pretty easy to deal with, okay? And so these different extraction voltages are are something you are just told. You know, if I'm working in high resolution, I use gun lens two. If I'm working in STEM, I use gun lens eight. And that's just different uh, extraction and anode voltages, so you get different performance out of the thing. Okay? It's like the vein help, but there's two of them, okay? So that's a thank you. This is Lior asked the question of is this like the vein held in lab six? And then in the lab six, right, there's a single um, electrostatic lens that is simply taking the, the electrons off that are coming off of the filament and focusing them to a point. Okay? And this essentially here, this gun crossover, becomes the new point image of electrons for the rest of the machine. Okay? We'll get into that as we talk about lenses more. Here it's two things. We have to have one to extract right, and one to focus. So it's a two-part anode. The first one, local to the tip, is providing the high degree of field to extract the electrons. And then the second one is being used to, again, act like a lens. If you look, that looks like a lens, right? You're taking a point source and focusing it to a point source on the other side. It's a two-part lens, one of which is used to pull the electrons out, and the other of which is to focus it down to a point. Okay? So again, this becomes the new gun crossover. And as far as the microscope is concerned, that's the new virtual source of electrons. Um, the 300 kV, or how much we use, is at the bottom of the second one with respect to ground. Yes, that's correct in the field emission source, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, so the, the system sits, this, is, this sits on top of that, the V1 on top of that. Okay, I'm pretty sure of that. I'll check on that. Um, okay. But that's it, so this is now your, your new virtual source for the thing. Um, so again, just one more summary for you uh, to compare all the different types, um, right, tungsten lab six, and this is just simply the Schottky field emission. I don't have cold field emission specs here, it's, but you can see, right, that there's some different things. In the case of the field emission, it's good that there's a long lifetime on it because they're a pain in the neck to change. Um, thankfully, I've had mine over in, in Burke working for two, and, two years now, so that's good because they're very difficult to change. Lab sixes, this says 500. We usually get more like 1,000 out of it. Um, but again, comparisons of brightness, comparisons of current densities, comparisons of the crossover size, right? This represents then the, um, the uh, spatial coherency numbers and all these things here for you for your future edification, okay? 
So that's it with electron guns, and uh, what I'll do next is start in on electron optics. Does anyone have any questions on that before we go forward? Anything else, Lior? Okay. One of the things that's nice is uh, we do have one student who's used microscopes quite a bit. Lior has, has done this in his past, and that's great because uh, his questions will be uh, perhaps more informed and, and help me point out things that I missed. So please continue to do that. Thanks, Lior.